Everybody say hi to Ganon. He's big boy. <laughs> Hi, I can't have you up here, good boy. Hey everyone, Bandit here. I was researching some stuff about Zelda and Nintendo for a larger project that I have planned for the channel. Well, larger in terms of production quality anyway. And inadvertently, I stumbled across some of the Big N's history. Some, uh, less than favorable parts of Nintendo's history, that is. And I just want to put out there real quick, first and foremost, that in this video I am going to be covering a topic or two that's a little bit more mature than what I normally cover on the channel. So if you happen to have some little humans around, just be mindful of it. Anyway, these controversial pieces of Nintendo history were rather shocking to me, the masked Nintendo bandit, so I decided, why not share it with all of you? And real quick, before we get into the video, I'd like to make a wager with you that you can participate in if you would like to, kind of like what I did with my uh, Ganondorf facts video a little bit earlier on. If you learn one new thing when you watch this video, you have to leave a like down below. And if you learn at least three or more things, you have to subscribe to the channel, which I highly doubt that you will regret either way. But on the flip side, if you learn absolutely nothing about Nintendo from the contents of this video, then let me know in a comment below and I will come down there and like that comment personally. Let's have a virtual shake on it. I'm just gonna assume that you're doing the hand up. Uh, let's get into the list. Number one, the company that made Donkey Kong sued Nintendo. And no, you did not hear that incorrectly. I said the company that made Donkey Kong. But let me explain what I mean by that. And you might want to buckle up because this one gets a little bit complicated. When you credit a company with making a product, especially in the entertainment industry, that encompasses a lot of moving pieces like design or build. In this case, Nintendo, or more specifically, Shigeru Miyamoto himself, did indeed make Donkey Kong in that he conceptualized and designed the smash hit game that was responsible for putting Nintendo on the map. But he did not build it. The actual work for coding the game and making it come to life was contracted out to another technology company that went by the name of Ikegami Sushiniki. Ikegami was hired by Nintendo to build Donkey Kong from the ground up. And once they were finished with the game, Ikegami then provided Nintendo with a certain number of circuit boards that were complete with the game installed on the board. But they themselves retained the only copy of the game's actual source code, only giving Nintendo the finished products. When Donkey Kong became the smash hit worldwide that we all know it did, Nintendo duplicated copies of these circuit boards of Donkey Kong, apparently without Ikigami's knowledge. And they didn't give them permission to do that beforehand. On top of that, when Nintendo inevitably decided to come out with Donkey Kong's sequel, Donkey Kong Jr., they built the second game off of the original source code. Knowing that Ikigami was the only company that had the source code, Nintendo instead hired somebody else to reverse engineer the game and therefore deduce the source code. According to a 19 1983 article from the Japanese gaming magazine called Game Machine, when Ikigami heard Nintendo was replicating circuit boards and reverse engineering the game, they took it straight to court. But Nintendo sued them right back, claiming that there were no royalties discussed in the original deal and that the work that had been delivered to them in the form of the game Donkey Kong had been paid for completely. They also had a one-up, if you will, on the situation since the game Donkey Kong had Nintendo's copyright logo in the game and not Ikigami's. Number second, the PlayStation was very briefly a Nintendo console. In the early 90s, and after lots of success in the 80s following the releases of Donkey Kong, Super Smash Bros., The Legend of Zelda, Super Metroid, and their home consoles like the Famicom and the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, Nintendo was looking to partner up with an electronics company in order to take all this stuff to the next level and create an add-on to the SNES that would enable larger games to be developed for the system. The trick was that the new add-on would use interactive optical discs called Compact Disc Interactables, or Philips CDI for short. And if that name rings a bell, it's probably because you've had nightmares of the Zelda CDI games. Anyway, so the story goes that Nintendo and Sony were the best of friends, really, with Sony even being responsible for developing the sound chips for the Super Famicom system. While the two mega companies were working together to develop the aforementioned CDI add-on for the SNES, all was going well and according to plan. At the Consumer Electronics Show in 1991, Sony proudly unveiled their new add-on to the SNES called the SNES-CD or the Nintendo PlayStation. One day later, Nintendo revealed that they decided to break ties with Sony and instead decided to go with Philips directly for the production of this add-on to the SNES. Sony's president at the time, a man named Norio Oga, was quite upset at this highly visible, extremely embarrassing turn of events, and then appointed Ken Kutaragi as the lead developer for Sony's PlayStation console, with one specific goal in mind. 
be Nintendo's rival. The PlayStation released as a standalone console in the 90s and competed directly with Nintendo's brand new Nintendo 64, with the former selling over 100 million units to date and the latter selling about 32 million. In addition to that, Nintendo's controversial new relationship with Philips directly resulted in the creation of the Zelda CDI game. So, you tell me who won that one. Number Tress, the Virtual Boy was not supposed to release when or how it did. If you're cocking your head to the side right now going, well, Virtual Boy, what the heck? Allow me to explain. The Virtual Boy console was Nintendo's first attempt at virtual reality gaming and released in 1995. It was infamously a commercial failure. I mean, they told news articles that it would sell 14 million copies in two years, and before they pulled the plug on it prematurely, it had managed to sell about 770,000. Yeah. It was named the Virtual Boy because it was developed by Gunpei Yokoi, the man responsible for creating the Game Boy, which was a commercial success. Story goes that Yokoi had largely been left alone to develop the Virtual Boy with little to no input or oversight from Nintendo's current big dog of video games, Shigeru Miyamoto. Apparently, Nintendo released the Virtual Boy way too early and directly against Yokoi's wishes, who said that he would have never released it in its released state. Eventually, it was revealed that they did this so that they could focus the development resources that were on the Virtual Boy to to the Nintendo 64, which they were currently trying to push production on. This may have actually been because of the whole PlayStation situation, which had released in 1994, and which the Nintendo 64 was supposed to directly compete against. To make matters worse, after 31 years of faithful service to the company, the legendary Mr. Yokoi retired in his 50s, apparently voluntarily and conveniently right after the disaster of the Virtual Boy, which Nintendo insists was not because of the Virtual Boy. Personally though, I think there might be a little something more to that story since immediately after leaving Nintendo, he went on and started another game company called Koto, and then died one year later in the year 1997. Number Delta you have the Japanese Yakuza to thank for your video games. Nintendo as a company was born in the year 1889, you know, a, a few years before video games were on the market. Their first and only products were playing cards, like physical playing cards, which were bought for the purposes of gambling. However, in 1907, the government of Japan banned all forms of gambling under the new at the time penal code. Chapter 23. So all of a sudden, nobody was buying Nintendo's playing cards, which was their one and only thing that they made. So their days were over and they had to scramble to find something else to make, right? Nope, they still made cards, but they just manufactured a different kind of card called Hanafuda, which was not outlawed because Hanafuda cards did not have numbers on them. But how do you gamble with cards that don't have numbers on them, right? Well, Yakuza certainly figured it out, and they wanted those cards. Lots of them. And as the Yakuza-Hanafuda connection became more and more obvious to the entire country of Japan, all of the rival Hanafuda card production companies shut down production because they didn't want to be associated with, you know, organized crime. But Nintendo didn't really mind, and so it was that Nintendo became one of the only companies to continually produce Hanafuda cards which were almost exclusively purchased by the Yakuza for the purposes of illegal gambling. On the plus side, Nintendo made a lot of money off of all of this and was brought out of otherwise sure death. They rode all this money off the Yakuza business all the way until the 1960s when they decided to get into some other forms of entertainment. Which brings me to the final point. Number V. I don't even have a crafty title for this. Nintendo made love hotels. You know, hotels that uh, couples go to so that they can... Love. Not even joking. In the 60s, after the boom of the Hanafuda card business had begun to dwindle, the current president of Nintendo at the time, a man by the name of Hiroshi Yamauchi, saw an opportunity in the booming business potential of love hotels, which were and are not illegal in Japan, by the way. Apparently, there were even talks between Nintendo and the heads of the Yakuza about incorporating prostitution into their love hotels, which was illegal. But nothing ever came of these talks, as around this time, in 1966, a certain 25-year-old maintenance engineer named Gunpei Yokoi was noticed developing what would soon become a hit child's play toy called the Ultra Hand. And since then, the company has focused exclusively on creating entertainment in a more family-friendly way. As opposed to a family-creating way. And that's the list. How did you do? Did you learn one new thing? 
be sure to leave a like below on this video. Did you learn at least three new things? It would be an honor to me if you would subscribe to the channel. Did you learn nothing at all? Well, head on down to the comments below and let me know and I'll be sure to come down there and give it a like. You can still like or subscribe though. It's not exclusive to the deal. You won't regret it. Anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching and a huge thanks, of course, to my fabulous Bandit crew, of which I have some new names to announce. Please say hello to Moon Ann, Brent J, Pascal, Hatter, and where's the lamb sauce? Thank you guys so much for joining up and to you watching, if you are interested in helping these videos get made and helping me to eat food and stuff like that, feel free to click on that join button located below any of my videos or follow the links in the description below for my Patreon and merch pages. Also down there are the links to my social media pages, so come follow me for more little random facts and spicy takes and whatever the heck I feel like tweeting. Oh, and I had one more thing to talk about before I end the video. As some of you know, I went live with my Let's Play channel this week and things have been going great. Thank you so much to those of you who have stopped by or even subscribed to Bandit Plays and to those of you who are curious about what that is, I'll link to it in the description below so you can check it out yourself. But I just wanted to take a moment real quick and thank a good friend of mine who was very instrumental in helping me go live with Bandit Plays. This isn't sponsored or anything, I just felt like giving him some thanks. His name is Art of Joe and he runs a webcomic called Charming. And let me tell you, it's charming, all right? If you like witty or punny humor like I do, especially the kind that's based off of like fairy tales and stuff, you know, kind of like uh, the Shrek movies, you will love this webcomic. It is hysterical. I've not been disappointed in a single chapter yet. I'll link to it in the description below as well. And on his behalf, thank you so much in advance for checking that out. I think that's all I've got for you in this one. So as always, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. This is Mass Nintendo Bandit. Looking forward to seeing you in the next one and signing out. Peace.